So what's going on between the two of you, and uh, what are you thinking, what are you feeling? Well, and, uh... I wanted to bring up something that um, if right, right after we did our thing last time, um, you, you mean at the UCLA? Yeah, yeah, that you, you were lecturing, and something just really resonated for me, and I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about this a little bit more. Um, you're talking about couples where one loses interest in sex because they've been controlled as children, and that totally has been a dynamic between Mark and I, where it's like I never want to make love, but when we do, it actually is very good. So that's right. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah so I just wanted to. That would be more yeah. your issue than. Oh, your totally. Issue. And actually, fortunately, I've always been very clear that it was my issue, so that it hasn't pushed up Mark's issues, which you know normally he would. I think it feel not. And actually, he, he's. You didn't get I still do that. Something yeah. wrong with sexually. She doesn't really yeah. love you. I still do yeah. that. We ascend all that. Yeah. Yeah. But, and he no. actually has done that a couple times and gotten angry with me. But then I'm very clear that it's not him yeah. and has nothing to do with you know my how desirable I find him or anything like that. Um, and and sort of on our own, you know, I've kind of been able to figure out what that's about. But I'd like to talk about it some more. Um, I mean, it's it's yeah. a more subtle problem with women than is with. It's yeah. very common, by the way. If you haven't seen it in your practice, I can assure you. I well. just got a client this week where yeah. it is in the couple. Once yeah. you see it, you have to you have to you understand the problem yeah. because until you see it, <clears throat> and I'll tell you that an awful lot of sex therapists don't understand this problem mm -hmm. because it's not a it's not a performance issue. It's not it's not what it's about. It's uh, it's a relationship issue, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's best. I think I said that last time. Didn't I? It's best treated by couples therapists um, rather than by sex therapists, right. <clears throat> because that has to do with the kind of stuff that we're that we've been talking about right along. Um, and the, where, where, the the issue has to do with and we'll see if it fits for you. The issue usually has to do with a a lack of desire. It's, you don't feel like having sex. Oh, yeah, and I would never initiate it, but once we actually start making love, I'm fine. It's very typical. It's very typical. Because the bad news is that there's no uh, lack of interest, which then can be personalized by you. Right. And uh, there, there are many men, uh, I hope you're not in that category, who can't even enjoy sex unless the woman is all turned on and charged up and, and, and all of that. Um, so that's a that's a, that's a bit of a problem. The good news is that if you if you get into it, right. Once I get past that initial resistance, it's not a problem. And and Mark can feel that, so it doesn't push his issues. Good. You, you can you can you can feel her responding and things. Right. Are, right. Right. How often do you have sex? Uh, I don't know. Is it even once a week? Maybe. Um, yeah, most of the time. Sometimes, sometimes less, but... Well, you're, you're, you're uh, bouncing around the national average. Yeah, and actually what we've even done, we've kind of, even before you said this, we've kind of just scheduled it. Good. Right. Well, you know my point of view about that, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I feel like a voice in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah. I really do. I think that... <clears throat> Right. But does that Everybody happen? thinks yeah. sex should be spontaneous. Well, so <coughs> children. Got to have spontaneity. Like an animal. Yeah. Good, sex is, good sex is never spontaneous, right? No. When you were when you were single and you were dating, uh, when you were first met and kind of in love with each other, was your sex spontaneous? The answer is no. No. It was planned. You knew what was happening when you were going out, and I mean, maybe you didn't say that, but everybody knew what was going to take place and how it was going to go right. down. So good sex is scheduled sex. Now, one thing, does does that ever go away, that we're all just feeling resistant to making love? OK, so that's always going to be there. OK, now, and, and I'm wondering, I say that. but now even I working on, that. even working on that <coughs> understanding of what, what caused this? No. <coughs> I, I, I think. It's a, it's a great question, and, and I, I hate to say, no, it won't go away. Um, because in theory, you should be able to do something with it. 
and, and probably can. But it's not one of those problems that, when you understand it, it sort of dissolves. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's not, uh, it's, it's not one of those problems that if we send you to the right therapist who makes the right interpretation or mm -hmm. gives you the right ex exercise at home, it goes away. It, it doesn't. But it is treatable. <clears throat> And the way you treat it is by the dialogue of intimacy, because the issue is an issue around closeness. That's what it's about. And at an unconscious level, there's a fear of being controlled, taken over, dominated, enveloped. And a way of protecting, there's a linkage between sex and closeness. And so what, what happens is, it doesn't happen with everybody, but what happens sometimes is that when that connection is made, the, the person who has the, the, the problem then loses sexual desire, having nothing to do with you. Strangely enough, your crime is that she fell in love with you, that she wants to be married to you, that she has a commitment to you, that you are special, and you add a few more adjectives to that. That's your crime. Um, Tell, tell me about your relationship with your uh, with your mother and father. Oh well, I mean, I came from a exceptionally enmeshed family. I mean, it was real on that end of the spectrum, and it just my parents both very critical, very controlling. Um, I, I remember very critical and very controlling. And as right. you recall, one part of criticism is control, right? An emotion yeah. attached to a person that with a judgment and a demand. So the demand part is controlling. So they're controlling when they're critical, and they're controlling when they're controlling. Right. And then also, <clears throat> on top of it, Mark came from a similar family, although without, I think, the, the enmeshment. So he can also, both of us, can be controlling and critical, but I'm very, just exquisitely sensitive to any like control on his part. And I just... Um, but just a couple things. I mean, I remember as a kid, like having tension headaches almost every day, worried that, like anxious that my mother would, you know, that whatever I was doing, it wasn't the right thing. Like if I was reading, that she would get upset with me. Oh, you should be out playing. Or she just, it was, and, and how I had to take care of her. She was very, very anxious. And uh, I, I mean, one example, God, this still bothers me, but, um, I mean, this was a th I, just one thing that really affected me. Uh, when I was in junior high, we went out to, it was some kind of school function. It was in the evening. And at one point, you know, I was with a girlfriend and we kind of wandered off to get a little privacy and we're talking. And my mother just got furious that I, you know, sort of wasn't with her. That I actually, and, and again, um, I remember. It's a metaphor for the whole problem in the relationship, right? You're not allowed to be a separate person. You're oh, not allowed totally. To, you're not allowed to move away. You're, you have to be, uh, you have to be with her. That's the enmeshed. Uh, right, right. And again, you know, I think she, you know, was a little socially phobic, although socially skilled. Um, and you know, the kind of situation was uncomfortable for her, and so she was upset with me <laughs> for not being there in case she wanted to leave or and and I remember she she told me that she was ashamed I was her daughter you know for doing that. and I just what she was ashamed that you were her daughter if she was ashamed, exactly and and just remembering it at what that age that, that oh it just felt terrible and and I just remember um you know at that age thinking she didn't like me and, um, and I, I was kind of surprised. I was talking with one of my sisters recently, and her feeling the same thing, which really kind of surprised me, because I thought it was unique to me. Well, you know, that's what we do as kids. We believe that it's, it's, we believe that the reason why my mother's treating me the way she's treating me is because of me. I'm, I'm no good. And if I were good, then everything would be fine. And then. We, we don't we don't have the capacity as children. We have to do that. When we have to do that good work when we grow up. We don't have the capacity as children to think to look up at this crazy woman who's treating me the way she's treating me and say, "Oh boy, she really has some uh, internal problems that she's projecting onto me." And she's uh, kind of narcissistic and and uh, maybe even borderline. And wow, this is really terrible stuff. We don't think like that, right? What we think is, my mother's mad at me. She's criticizing me. I'm bad. 
And then my, my father used to collude with that and just like my mother was upset. It was our, you know, what are you kids doing? Uh, and then he also was very controlling. You know, if he wanted to garden, the whole family had to garden. And I mean, it was not an option not to. If, if you told me this before, I missed it. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I knew you had critical parents, but I didn't know yeah. that they were as 